My name is Robin Gross, and I'm the moderator for this session, and I'm the uh, chair of the non-commercial stakeholder group at ICANN. Um, this is a session on civil society in ICANN and multi-stakeholderism in the GNSO, that specific example. Uh, so we've got a, several representatives from the GNSO. We've got representatives from civil society, particularly the non-commercial stakeholder group. And then we've got representatives from business and from government um, to also add to the experience of working with civil society in the GNSO. So let me start out by just giving a real basic, uh, how does ICANN make policy within the GNSO? So ICANN um, is an organization that claims to make policy from the bottom up. So how does this happen? Well, there are a number of working groups that get set up, and there are a number of comment periods, and, and people in the community can join these working groups and can join uh, can participate in the comment periods and provide their various uh, input into uh, how policy is made on very specific issues. Um, the overall structure of ICANN is such that there's uh, uh, governments participate, uh, business participates, civil society participates, contracted parties participate, and there are different structures. So, so in ICANN, governments generally participate via the GAC, the Governmental Advisory Committee. And uh, there are, there's at-large, which includes a number of, of civil society members as well. These are individuals, and they also participate as an advisory committee. And then we come to the GNSO, part of, of ICANN. It's really supposed to be bottom-up from, from the community. And so that's where we've got representatives from civil society, from business, from the contracted parties, and um, we all make up the GNSO together, and we all participate in these working groups and provide comments on various uh, specific issues that then go to uh, the GNSO council to get voted on. So on the, the GNSO is basically divided into two houses. So we've got this bicameral structure. There's the contracted par parties on one side and, and the non-contracted parties on the other side. Um, within the uh, within the, the, the contracted parties, we've got uh, a number of constituencies, the uh, ISPs, the intellectual property constituencies, and the business constituencies, and they participate uh, in the commercial stakeholder group. And then in the con in the, uh, also in the, uh, the um, non-contracted parties house are the non-commercial users, and that's where uh, the non-commercial stakeholder group, which consists of the uh, constituencies within it, including the non-commercial stakeholders, excuse me, the non-commercial users constituency, and the not-for-profit operational concerns constituency. So for short, they're called NCUC and NPOC. And so basically, the GNSO is made up of these uh, six, seven different constituencies that all feed their ideas and their different perspectives into the policy development process and uh, participate in these working groups and then the output of these working groups goes to the GNSO Council for voting up or down, which if it gets voted up, it then goes up to the Board of Directors to be voted up or down. And, and then once it's approved, it gets implemented into policy for everyone. Okay, so let me just, that's very basic, very basic background. Um, if, if you're interested in participating, um, if you're if you're in civil society, if you're a non-commercial user in particular, you may want to think about joining the non-commercial stakeholders group. And you might say, why? Uh, what's your interest? Well, if you are concerned about uh, non-commercial interests in the policy development process, things like human rights, things like the development issues, uh, freedom of expression, privacy rights, uh, bringing in uh, new and diverse views into the ICANN process, you may be interested in joining the, the non-commercial stakeholder group. So let me sort of next move to the two constituencies within the non-commercial stakeholder group that we just talked about. Uh, the NCUC, which was uh, the first constituency uh, to represent non-commercial users, and the NPOC, Not-for-Profit Operational Concerns, which is a recent um, addition to the GNSO. So let me just first start with, with Bill, who's the chair of the non-commercial users constituency, and if you want to tell us a little bit about NCUC. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Certainly. I'm sorry, I forgot that. Um, 
down here at the end, we've got Stefan Van Gelder, and he is with the commercial stakeholder group and used to be the chair of the uh, GNSO, and then immediate the GNSO Council, excuse me. <laughs> and then um, immediately to my right, we've got uh, Bill Drake, who's the chair of the uh, NCUC constituency. And then to my left, we've got Marie-Laure Marie Lemonur, who's the chair of, <laughs> I'm sorry, this one. I'm sorry, two to my left. <laughs> who's the chair of the not-for-profit operational concerns constituency, NPOC. And then immediately here to my left is Olga Cavalli. And uh, she's with the Argentine government, so she participates in the GAC, although she used to participate in the GNSO with us as a representative uh, or as a, as a participant from the non-com. And she was the vice chair of the GNSO. And then down at the end here, we've got Bertrand de, de la Chapelle, and who's on the ICANN uh, board uh, currently, and before that was with the GAC, the, uh, the governmental advisory board, and um, he's from France, and so he can help talk about the perspective of, of both governments and the board in their interactions with the civil society and the GNSO. Okay, so now that we've done a quick introduction, let me go back to Bill, who's the uh, chair of the NCUC. And Bill, if you want to give us a bit of, a, of, an, of an overview of NCUC. Hello, everybody. Uh, I will do that. But uh, first, I want to ask a, a, a question and then maybe put things into a broader context. So. As I look out in the room, uh, I see a lot of ICANN veterans. So that it would be help us to calibrate this conversation if we had a sense. Uh, if people could raise their hand, how many of you are basically familiar with ICANN's internal processes and the GNSO? Just so I know. Okay. So there's some, it's, a, it's a mix. So we've got some folks for whom this would be relatively new and some folks folks who have lived through it directly. Um, and so we will try to phrase it in a way that hits the sweet spot between talking to the insiders who are already deep into ICANN and people for whom this is a relatively new thing. And of course, whenever you start to approach anything about ICANN, you're immediately, immediately hit with a lot of acronyms and uh, strange relationships between organizational units and things like that, which can make your head spin, etc. So let me just back off one step first to say why we're doing this and to put this into the broader context. We talk a lot in the Internet Governance Forum and in related processes about the benefits and joys and pains and sorrows of multi-stakeholder cooperation. Um, but very often those discussions are fairly abstract. In the IGF, after all, we are basically having dialogue together about things. We don't very often talk in concrete ways about how does multi-stakeholderism actually work in decision-making processes where things are actually being decided that have real-world consequences and where there's actual uh, power and material interests at stake and pa parties are divided and there's bargaining and negotiations and hard feelings and long processes and all those other kinds of things that go on. So we thought it would be useful to uh, take a, a look at the case of the, the role of civil society in the, the GNSO Council as a sort of instance, I was going to use an academic word, as an instance of a larger set of phenomena, um, which is you know, the, the challenges of making multi-stakeholder cooperation work when it's not just dialogue, when we're really trying to do something in the way of adopting policies, et cetera. And we, in, we represent civil society, the, the groups that are here, within the GNSO, which, as Robin was saying, does the policy development process for generic top-level domains, the .coms, the .orgs, and so on, as well as, of course, now we have in ICANN, I'm sure people know, the new GTLD program, which uh, starting next year will start to add many hundreds of new extensions into the domain name space. Um, so the consequences uh, of that are fairly significant. So we're actually involved in, in making decisions around uh, policy uh, selections, which then go to the board and so on. And we have, by the way, just to, to flag the point, um, amongst uh, some of the people in the room, um, I'm very happy to say we have no less than three 
former chairpersons of the GNSO Council. We have Chuck Gomes over here, Avi Doria over here, Jonathan, oh, the current chair of the GNSO Council, Jonathan Robinson is listening in online, and we have Stefan Van Gelder here who's been chair. So we have here then in this room, or close to it, virtually, four people who have been in charge of managing the council where all of these different interests are aggregated and have to be fought out over exactly how we're going to do domain name policy. So I think we have the basis for some interesting perspectives. Briefly, NCUC was the first non-commercial grouping that was established in ICANN uh, back in, what, 1999, I suppose, when I, the, the, it was actually the, the GNSO was, had a different name, which I'm going to, the DNSO, the Domain Name Supporting Organization. And uh, it has grown over time. We have now over 300 members, about, I think, 85 or 80 organizational members, and then a couple of hundred individual members. Um, and uh, it has been very concerned over the, the course of its history, in particular with issues of civil liberties. Uh, our, our community is very globalized. More than two-thirds of our members are from outside the United States. Um, but, and yet, uh, our major concerns have tended to be around questions of privacy, freedom of speech, things like that. But the agenda has grown to encompass many other dimensions as ICANN's mission has grown. And so we've gotten very interested in development and a lot of other, the larger geopolitics of internet governance and so on and so forth. So basically, all the different aspects of, of GTLD policy that uh, the GNSO handles, the NCUC tries to represent uh, civil society interests and has been doing that for quite some time. Um, we should note that there's also the, the second constituency, the newer constituency, which Marie Laura is the chair of, which we'll introduce. And I'll also say that outside of the GNSO, we have the at-large structure, which is important as well in ICANN. At-large is supposed to represent um, the interests of individual users. And it includes a lot of civil society people, as well as some commercial people, uh, commercial users. Um, and they have a broader kind of view. They're not just focused on the GNSO like we are. They're, interested, they're involved with the broader range of ICANN activities, including what goes on in the country code, uh, and the CCNSO, and the GAC, and so on and so forth. So ICANN has many different pieces. Civil society players are spread about. Uh, in different spots in ICANN. And what we're going to try to do here is talk a little bit about how it really works in the nitty gritty uh, on the ground level. By the way, NCUC, if anybody's interested to know more, we have a very simple uh, URL, which if I could project something on the screen, I would, but it's just simply ncuc.org. And I see a number of NCUC members in the room too. So, okay, so with that, let me hand the mic over. This is awkward that we have to do it this way. Let me or is there another mic there? Okay, so Mary Laura, you want to talk about impact? Is it? Thank you, Bill. I think you said it all. I don't have much to say now. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, Robin already said that um, uh, our constituency is rather new. I mean, we've been celebrating our two years anniversary uh, last, Jan uh, last June. So, and um, uh, sitting here, I'm like the newest recruit because I've been involved with ICANN for a year and a half. So I'm still uh, one of those people who are learning uh, ac some of the acronyms because it, it, it takes quite a long time to get familiar with, uh, you know, all the acronyms and, and the dynamic within the institute organization and uh, the, uh, all the, um, the working group and the way, the way you can get involved. It's rather complicated, but once you can grasp it, it's, you can, you get really, I basically, I don't want to use the, the expression that I fell in love with it, but you, 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 you really get excited and you realize that uh, this is an opportunity to uh, live the experience of the multi-stakeholder model on a daily basis. And, and uh, we, we, we're going to talk about a little bit about that. But basically, in POC, uh, as, uh, as uh, Bill said, uh, our members are not for pro not not for profit organizations. We're not allowed uh, in our group to have individual members. It's just organizations, and um, um, well, um, our policy agenda is very much linked 
to obviously the ICANN agenda, but we also have sort of a, a, a leg outside ICANN uh, through uh, a partnership that we uh, established, established sorry, with other NGOs, and we're trying to have to, to uh, touch upon other policy issues outside the ICANN world, and I'll, I'll be somewhere to talk about that later on. So this is, are we supposed to, that's, that's your turn. Great, thank you, Marie-Laure. Um, Stefan, if you could maybe give us a, a quick um, <laughs> something about your experience with the GNSO and what you can provide an overview. Yeah, Robin, thanks very much. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Stefan Van Gelder. Um, and as a, as a former GMSO chair, what I really wanted to address here was um, both the situation uh, from uh, the viewpoint of the constituency that I represented when I was uh, GMSO chair, which was the registrar constituency or stakeholder group, as it's now called, and um, the situation as I saw it when I become chair. Now, I should explain that, that being the chair of the GNSO Council is much more of a neutral role, or supposed to be, than um, being a member of the council representing a constituency or stakeholder group. So once you, you become chair, you are a representative of the council as a whole. And um, what tends to happen is that you come in uh, as a member of the council representing a group, ready to fight for that group's interests in a multi-stakeholder environment without having a clear definition of what that means. Because um, when you're talking about multi-stakeholder environment, you're supposed to be talking about an environment that fosters discussion and understanding what the other groups are either interested in, talking about, defending, looking after. Uh, so it implies a certain degree of, of breaking out of your own silo and, and going on knocking on other people's doors and trying to understand their points of view and to integrate them into a general uh, viewpoint which can then be um, used by the council as a whole. Um, now, I, I, my own personal experience is that uh, I only really began to do that effectively once I became chair because the role demanded that I be chair of the whole group. And it was much easier for me. And I personally, I don't know whether Avery or Chuck or Jonathan will speak to this, but uh, personally, I, I found it very, a lot more comfortable being in that role, being able to talk to everyone, being able to take time to understand those issues. And that was the point where I felt um, multi-stakeholderism was really working for me because I was actually actively going out to to understand everybody's points of view. So I have to admit that the people uh, to my left, uh, uh, Bill, Robin, and others, uh, were a great help in helping me understand uh, these, well, civil society viewpoints. And I, with my business background, I, I would say that um, I probably missed a lot of that before. Uh, entering um, the discussion from the viewpoint of being a neutral chair. Uh, I think that's relevant to what goes on here at the IGF because I think it's important uh, for people at the IGF to realize that they are also working in this multi-stakeholder environment and that also requires um, everyone to try and maybe go out of their own silos and try and understand what other people's viewpoints are. I'm not entirely sure that it's as easy to do as we all think it is or perhaps we all think we're doing it but certainly I thought I was doing it before and found out that uh, uh, I was probably not doing it as much as I could um, so from that point of view my, my um, experience as chair was uh, extremely gratifying and, and I felt um, you know I could really feel the benefit of true multi-stakeholderism uh, in that kind of environment. And I believe that civil society is playing a very important role in that model by, by you know, making that point as often as they can because 
a lot of the time they're coming at the debate um, free of some of the agendas that business people might have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stefan. Um, thank you, Robin. Thank you, Bill, for the invitation, and thanks to all the friends here from whom I have learned so much in the CMSO. You may wonder why a person that now works for the government is doing in the CMSO. That's, uh, I, I, at that time, I was interested in in the ICANN structure in general and interested in the policy development process of ICANN because I was working on my PhD, which is about uh, internet governance and development countries. And I decided to apply through the non-com to the GNSO. A friend of mine came to me before and he said, you should apply for CCNS. So I said, no, I want the GNSO because this is where real things happen in ICANN. And I was not wrong at all. A uh, nice thing to tell you is the first email I got when I was appointed by the non-com was an email from a representative of the business constituency saying, we shouldn't have non-com appointees from developing countries. Why we have them? There is no need for that. I said, wow, this is, will be interesting. And it was. It has been, for me, a fantastic learning experience. I have said this to you many times, and I, I, I really believe that. My English improved a lot, uh, you, you can be sure about that. And uh, I also learned so much from all of you, from Chuck, Stefan, Bill, Robin, uh, all of you uh, in the GNSO, and I enjoyed my time in the GNSO. Um, as I was kind of, um, I received kind of a reaction from the business part of the GNSO and was so welcomed by the civil society part of it, then I, I became kind of, uh, an advocate of the civil society representatives in the GNSO somehow, and and they finally decide me decide to propose me as, as vice chair, and, and, and I was selected. And I work with Chuck and Stefan, so this is a little bit a little bit of my my story. I uh, let me tell you that my experience in the GNSO is fantastic now as my role of GAC representative in the GAC, uh, of our, uh, representative of Argentina, because I understand all the process in other SOs and ACs uh, much better than before. So for I think for the GAC that could be benefit. I, I don't know if other GAC members think uh, the same, but I do believe that for me it's very important. I stop now. Hi. Um, I have never been on the uh, GNSO Council or in any of the uh, structures within the GNSO. I may have to think about where I'm going to fit uh, after I leave the board <coughs> in uh, in a couple of weeks. That's actually the main reason why I accepted to be on this panel, because to see what are the various options. <laughs> <laughs> Joking. <coughs> A very private joke. Sorry for the people who are not I can sign up. Um, I've been in the GAC and <coughs> been even the vice chair of the GAC and the GNSO is, as you know, the structure inside of ICANN has three uh, steps dealing with different issues. There's one, there's the ASO that deals with, deals with addresses and most of the processes happen outside of ICANN and what is brought within the ICANN space is relatively little, if any. The CCNSO is a step that has a little bit more activity within ICANN, but the main objective of the CCNSO is to make sure that not too much of the community is meddling into the affairs of the CCNSO, because there are many things that they deal among themselves. The good thing is that they do it on the occasion of ICANN meeting also, and this is a good repartition of stuff. But the GNSO is the one that has the higher uh, step, or the most and the most complex structure. And the reason why it has the most complex structure is because everything that is related to G's is global rules. And guess what? <clears throat> Apart from ICANN, there is nothing that produces global rules. Therefore, the extremely complex structure that has been put in place, and I recognize that it's not only hard to understand at first glance, 
but also how to navigate and function on a, on a, on a daily basis is dealing with the extremely difficult task of developing rules, um, principles sometimes, but also decisions, operational decisions, that deal with a global resource. I used to call that, the I still call the domain name space, the semantic spectrum. And it's basically, even if a lot of people cringe about that, it's a quasi-regulatory function regarding how you allocate, ideally, what is a global common resource. The way it functions is mostly based on the so-called policy development process. The process has been reformed, and the structure of the GNSO has been reformed also uh, for a while. And one of the biggest changes, I think, from uh, in the policy development process was a few years ago to move from a so-called task force model to a working group model. The task force model led to a situation where, as the GNSO itself, the structure is composed of many different chambers, sub-chambers, sub-group constituencies, without getting into detail. The task force model, as I understand it worked uh, before I arrived, was mostly composing working groups or, or task forces with a very precise balance representing the different sub constituency. And the move to the working group model is something that has more or less erased this, this approach and has said, okay, when an issue is there, people who are from the different constituencies in the GNSO so can participate. And when I was in the GAC, uh, I have tried to push as much as possible for involvement of GAC members in the early stages of the discussion, including in the GNSO working group themselves. And I met a very strong resistance within the GAC for two reasons. One was, I think, a legitimate reason, which is that having crossed the chasm and gone into some of the working groups on some fascinating issues, and I love the experience, it is extremely time consuming. And the volunteers that, that are participating in those groups are really dedicating a huge amount of time. So the argument from a lot of my colleagues who didn't have the, the chance that I had to be mostly dedicated to internet governance, that was my portfolio, so it was already large with ICANN, ITU conferences, ITF, TSPD, and so on. All those mechanisms and all those processes had nothing to do with the work that most of my colleagues who were in the GAC were also doing back home when they were coming back from the very interesting ICANN meeting. Some of them are drafting legislation for uh, telecom regulation. Others are drafting legislation for accessibility at the local level, whatever. As Yanis Kaklin's former chair of the GAC was saying, this was his hobby job to be the chair of the GAC. It has changed significantly, but for a lot of GAC members, it is difficult to participate. That's the good reason. The bad reason is that the structure of ICANN has one major flaw, I think which is that the relationship with the GAC seemed to imply, I don't think this is as clear as that, but seemed to imply that the relationship of the GAC is only towards the board because it is supposed to give advice to the board. And it doesn't say much in the bylaws about how the government can participate earlier in the process. And for the previous reason, it's difficult. But I met another level of resistance that was almost a principal resistance, like <clears throat> where the government will only talk to the board, you know. Which is bad for everybody. It's bad for the GAC, because the earlier you can give your input, the better. Uh, and it's bad for the community and the process, because when people have worked a lot of, a long time, and I'm not saying that to flatter, but it's, it's a human thing. When you've worked a lot of time to produce something, and then the comments come at the late stage, it makes it harder for everybody. And especially now, I'm also speaking on the side of the board, because when you receive a situation where a lot of work has been done, and then there's another advice that is, for whatever uh, reason, uh, in contradiction to what the, the, the policy development process has produced, it is difficult to arbitrate, and it is difficult to handle it at the later stage. Why am I explaining all this? It's because the GNSO is 
the, the key part that defines global rules. That's what it is created for. And what I try to explain to people when, when they ask how I can function, a lot of people are presenting the, the structure, which is the wrong way to present ICANN, which is basically to explain how the board is composed. I, I hate this, this, <laughs> this drawing. The reality is ICANN is basically fulfilling the functions that exist in governance frameworks or governments at the national level. The SOs are the legislative part. The SOs are the, the part where the process of drafting the rule is being conducted. The staff, in its executive function, is implementing those things. It can be the INF function, it can be the G uh, GTRD program, it can be an everyday uh, thing. The board has a function of validation of the processes on both sides i.e. when a policy has been developed, it comes to the board and it is validated by the board after it's validated by the, the, the council of the GNSO or the others. When a staff makes a decision that needs a validation, it comes to the board as well. This articulation is relatively simple to understand. It just turns out that the portion that drafts the legislation in a certain way, the rules, is itself composed of the SOs plus the ACs that chime in. And if the ACs are chiming in on the process early, but also at a later stage towards the board, it makes it a little bit hard. In addition, the uh, relationship of the role of civil society is within the GNSO and in the um, also through the at large in the second second. So, the position that I've been in in the GAC, the position that I am now in, in the board. And the way I look at the GNSO process is I think it is currently requesting a tremendous amount of commitment by everybody and the time of everybody is not spent best. I personally believe that on most issues, and there's one of the questions that were circulated in advance, there is one thing that I think we should pay much more attention to is to identify issues earlier and get the whole community to freely discuss the issues in the GNSO space as early as possible, including government, including at large and the rest. Notion of birds of a feather, the notion of issue framing sessions before we start the PDP, before we start the issue paper, before we start any formal process is a stage that we systematically skip and because we skip it, we don't frame the issues in the right way, and we lose a lot of time and energy afterwards. So my suggestion is to think about the GNSO, not only in terms of structures and formal processes, but also as a space that should facilitate as much as possible a very broad discussion on issues and steer the broad discussion on issues as early as possible and as broadly as possible. Thank, thank you, Bertrand. Um, Stefan, was there something you wanted to add? Thank you very much, Robin. Just a small point, but I'm mindful that uh, when, when Bill asked, uh, there's half the people in the room who aren't familiar with the ICANN processes, and Olga mentioned the NOMCOM, and I, I, I'm fearful that I'll get fired if I don't uh, uh, mention, seeing I've just been selected to be NOMCOM uh, uh, chair-elect, that uh, it's actually the nominating committee, which is a, a, a way into uh, ICANN leadership positions from outside of the ICANN community, if you will, if I can sh if I can summarize it that way, and it's a process which happens every year, which everyone is welcome to apply for, uh, and uh, is a conduit to board, GNSO, CCNSO, and ALAC positions. Thanks, Robin. Can I? Um, actually, I think we need to back off even a further step because. Um, some things might not be entirely clear to folks who live outside the ICANN sphere. We've been talking about the GNSO Council and so on. Uh, we should make clear that each of the stakeholder groups that are involved in GTLD policy elect representatives to this council, and the council then votes on motions to adopt positions which then go to the board and so on. And it is there that a lot of our fighting and collaboration goes on. Now, there's also below the uh, not below the level of the council. Separate from the council, there are working groups formed by members of the community to work on particular issues, uh, and that percolates back up also to the council as well. 
but what's important to bear in mind, we have not really kind of made it clear here, I think, for civil society, we have, um, we are one quarter of this structure. There's the, there's the one house, which is the contracted parties, the registries and the registrars that are under contract with ICANN, cell domain name. Then there is the other half of the house, which is supposed to be the users. One half of that is business, and that's the commercial stakeholder group. It has three constituencies, intellectual property interests, the business constituency, and the internet service providers. And then the other quarter, that's us. And it's NPOC, NCUC, under the leadership of Obama. Okay, so we are one quarter of this larger structure. We have six votes. And one of the challenges then is on the one hand, you've got a structure here that more than any other process that I, I know, gives civil society a very direct possibility to impact decisions on policy by having votes on the decisions being able to help to write the, the texts uh, that are later go through the whole process and up to the board, et cetera, um, and, and can really uh, configure things. At the same time, we are also limited by the rules in some important ways because we can't pass anything on our own. Just because the six of us happen to agree, we have Wolfgang Kleinvector here as a member of the council for us. Um, at, Yes, and David Cake is here. He's a member of the council for us. Um, just because we all agree on a position, that means nothing. We're forced to find partners, either from the commercial stakeholder group or from the, the contracted parties, to try to push something through. And very often we fail. Very often civil society does not prevail. Um, and I would say more often than not, business interests tend to predominate in the GNSO because the GNSO, the GTLD space, is a space that involves big money, big players, and a lot of high stakes. And we're in there saying, hey, protect civil society's uses of the internet, hey, protect privacy. But we're often able to get good ideas into the process because we have a formal equality. There's even, even if the big players are more well-resourced, more influential, when it comes to being able to participate in the discussion, we each have an equal vote, we each have an equal say, we have the ability to sit next to each other and argue and try to persuade each other. And this is, I think, really a key aspect of multi-stakeholderism. And as I say, when you compare it to IGF and some other environments, you don't see that same dynamic. We are doing serious horse trading, back and forth, arguing, long nights, cooperating online, extensively in email, uh, constantly, monthly meetings, etc., trying to work out and find areas of consensus and dissensus among the parties. So I just wanted to get that on the table. It's a very intensive and unique environment, but it's one that actually does impact policy. By the way, there is a background paper on the website for this session, if you're interested, that lays out some questions and some basic points. Uh, has pointers to the, the websites of the organization. Okay. Thanks, Bill. Before we go to the questions, I think some folks here wanted to, to weigh in. Mari Lor? Yeah, just to, to uh, build on what uh, Bill just said about uh, we can't pass something on our own. Uh, it, 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 that, that's the beauty, I would say, of, of, of the model because it's about power sharing. I mean, it's a system where there is check and balances. I mean, it's it's what the multi-stakeholder model is about, I would say. And no one is more important than the other one. You know, we have to negotiate all to uh, get together and, and simply negotiate. Thank you, Robin. Um, my my one of my outcomes after the four years in the GNSO, and I think it's uh, a general comment about ICANN, is that. GNSO needs uh, regional balance, kind of desperate. Um, the resistance about comments and opinions from people from developing countries, it's, it's, you can feel that. And, and as uh, being a non-com chair, I encourage non-com to select uh, members that are relevant participants, that, that they can handle the language. It's not easy. If, if English is your second or third language, then uh, you have to be sure that you select them for the GNSO. And, and I'm, I mean it, this is real uh, challenging 
it's uh, talking on the phone and long long calls uh, um, and, and extremely complex conversations. So if your English is not uh, speed enough, uh, then it's extremely complex to participate in a, in a real relevant way and, and to, to make a real uh, uh, kind of contribution. Thank you so much. It's a jet lag that enables me my Spanish, not my English. Um, so um, that is also needed by ICANN. ICANN is going through this internationalization process. So that that is, uh, and, and I have a question for the two civil society, NCUC and MPOC. How many of the 300 uh, members or 100 individuals are from uh, Latin America, for example? Thank you. Uh, before answering to you, I would like to uh, to say that um, you, you just raised a very important issue. Actually, uh, um, a, re a first draft of report assessing the GNSO has just been released, and one of the weaknesses that has been uh, emphasized in the report is that within the GNSO, um, most region uh, the underdeveloped regions are not uh, represented, uh, and, and there are many. Uh, most of the participants are from the United States or from, from Europe. So this is uh, uh, what I would like to add is that as a, as a civil society, I'm feeling that um, we are uh, contributing to have some sort of geographic balance because uh, we just went through a process of election of, of uh, GNSO councillors and we actually had uh, two candidates from Africa, one from uh, north, uh, the northern part of Africa, one from Sub-Saharan Sub Afri uh, Africa, and, uh, and uh, one of them was, uh, was elected, actually. So I think that's one of the contribution of our contribution to the GNSO Council. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Okay. Um, I'm looking at the list of our members here. Uh, and it appears that about 15 of our 85 or so organizational members are Latin America. The largest number are Brazilian, but there are several Argentine, uh, Peruvian, but as I say, two thirds overall, two thirds of our membership is not from the United States. So we are definitely the most, I, I would say, NPOC and NCUC, uh, along with ALAC uh, at, at large, uh, that, that is to say, the non business parts of ICANN are by far the most internationalized parts of ICANN. Uh, there's no question about that, um, which I think is an interesting dynamic. Um, you know, we have a number of other people here who might, we might want to ask Aubrey or David or others. We have so many ICANN people in the room, including, as I say, several former chairs. I don't know if you want to get them involved. Well, I don't know if you want to but if you guys want to speak up, please do. David. Yeah, I, uh, I, uh, well, for a start, I want to say, uh, uh, David Cake um, from Electronic Frontiers Australia and currently a ICANN GNSO counselor for the non-commercial stakeholder group. Um, uh, well, we'll start just to, to, to that question about the international nature. I, I think uh, the NCSG is the only part of the GNSO council that actually has ensure, has rules in place to ensure that we are not all from one region. Um, and, and we have people, we, we currently have councillors from every, we have one from Brazil currently and one from, yeah, this is just one from that. From, from just, so, um, so it is, we do try, we do try to be international. But, but I just wanted to say my, one of the things that, um, it's very easy, uh, one of the great things about being in the, the GNSO council and being involved in a multi-stakeholder process is the, people uh, as, uh, Stefan kind of alluded earlier, your colleagues from other stakeholder groups are constantly schooling you in, um, and think then uh, teaching you a lot of this is, and several of, one of the things that has been um, uh, made, made clear to me by some of my councillor colleagues is, is, is how very important it is to distinguish between, we always talk about the GNSO when we mean the GNSO council, but they are not at all the same thing. The GNSO council is a figurehead, you know, you know it's, it's very, it, it appears very important because it meets very publicly and it has, it has elections and we get to sit on a big, a big uh, stage and make, uh, have public meetings. 
but the real work of the, the, the GNSO Council is a management body for the, the GNSO Council. It's not for the GNSO. It is not the GNSO. And the real work, the, the real reason why it all works is the working group. And the working group, um, they work so well because unlike us, I mean, there's the GNSO, which often has to vote and do a lot of procedural stuff. Often it really is just people, subject matter experts, getting in there together and digging in and adding their perspective. And this is part of the, the, uh, the GNSO, I mean, we talk a lot about multi-stakeholderism, but a GNSO working group is absolutely the place to experience it. You'll be sitting there with a lawyer and a technical expert and someone uh, who you know, understands the business process of registrar intimately, all working on the same thing. And it really works uh, very effectively when it does. You know, my comment I wanted to make for the, for the room about how the GNSO works in practice. It's, it's really the working group that's the magical Okay, thanks. First, we've got, uh, okay, Aubrey, did you, you have a remote? Okay. And let me get a cue. Who else wanted to speak? Aubrey, Stefan, Bertrand, this gentleman. That would be great. And then, and then maybe we can get oh, into the question. Oh. Hey, thanks. Uh, I'm, I'm Aubrey Doria. A remote moderator and first I'm going to read a couple comments that I have and then I am actually going to make a comment on my own. Uh, so I have from Jonathan Robinson who is the current chair of, of the GNSO Council uh, and there was two comments here and part of it goes to what David was saying whilst in initiation of much of the work and voting on the outcomes takes place in the GNSO Council much of the hard work takes place in the working groups which are open to all and that was a, a, an important consideration. Um, then registry stakeholder has three counselors from three distinct regions by latitude, Americas, EMEA, and Asia. So, so there is some diversity beyond just the, the civil society uh, quadrant. So um, I, I guess now that I've got the microphone, I did, I did want to comment on, on a few things. And, just by way of background, I did serve five years in the GNSO Council and have been insane enough to get uh, elected to go back into it. Uh, so I actually really find it a, a worthwhile place to be for some reason. Um, but and, and, and indeed, I, I, do, I do echo the, the comment of it that it's sort of being a, a core, in a sense, or very much one of the engines where a lot of both the, the energy of, uh, of ICANN comes from, a lot of the crisis of, of ICANN comes from. Uh, one thing that I wanted to point out that you talked about civil society being one quarter, and then we look at the rest of it and sort of, well, what are the other three quarters? And we've gotten very used to saying, well, you know, half of them, two of the other quarters are people that have contracts with, with ICANN, okay. And then we have another quarter that have people that are the commercial users and registrants with ICANN. Okay, so it looks like, well, that's a fair balance, right? There's one quarter and a quarter and another two. But then you can also look at it and say, oh, there are three commercial quarters and one civil society quarter. And so that's always one of the things that, that, I, that I like to point out. Um, I also wanted to go back slightly in history because when I started in the GNSO Council, there was actually an active uh, liaison with the board who participated in all the meetings, who commented. Uh, we would get communications from the GAC. I mean, there's a liaison from the GAC. And we would get, li they would, we would get uh, comments from them. We would respond to those comments. And then at a certain point, we weren't really doing what those comments had requested, so the liaison sort of stopped. And that's when the philosophy of, well, we can't really work with the GNSO, we have to work with the board. But when I first came into the GNSO, that, that notion hadn't quite gelled, and the liaison was active, and the relationship between the two was active. 
but, but my impression is that we didn't do what we were supposed to do, so the liaison became more of a liability than a, than a, um, than a benefit. So yeah, that was pretty much what I wanted to say. Great, thank you. Um, sir, did you have a, a comment you wanted to make? Okay, so Stefan, while we're figuring this out out here, why don't you go ahead? Thanks, Robin. Yeah, just um, picking up on a couple of points that have been made. Um, I, I, I'm trying to, I mean, we could we could devolve this discussion into a technical debate about the GNSO, which probably wouldn't be very interesting to most. But uh, another thing, another way of looking at it is to try and and be forward looking and see how. Um, uh, with uh, the understanding that there's an impending GNSO review coming up, how the GNSO might evolve to better take into account um, multi-stakeholderism and the variety of interests that are represented on the council. I mean, w one of the things that David said was uh, something that I heard a lot as chair and that w I actually felt pressurized as chair a lot about, which is the conflict between the GNSO community and the GNSO council, which I've never understood, um, to be honest. And I think, uh, um, yes, the GNSO council is the place where there are rules and procedures to ensure that there is a certain amount of representation of the different groups. Uh, there's no such rules and procedures on, in the GNSO at working group level. Anybody can well, most working groups, anybody can go in. So you can get working groups that are actually very lopsided uh, compared to the council, and you can get working groups that work very well. But um, looking forward, I think the questions we want to ask ourselves are how can we steer the review, the GNSO council review, so that um, there is better representation than the current system, which most people, the bicameral, so two, two, house, two houses, uh, as described earlier, um, one which is, yes, yes, Avery, it is three parts to one, commercial to non-commercial, but um, one house is strictly contracted with ICANN. Um, so currently the structure is a bit strange. How can we steer that review to make sure that everyone feels that they are better represented, I think is, is the key issue in front of us, to really make sure that multi-stakeholderism principle uh, works and works effectively so that the effective contributions of civil society, business, be it contracted with ICANN or not, um, is truly felt uh, through these processes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Bertrand, did you have a comment? Actually, it's, it's going exactly in the direction of, uh, of Stefan. I, I was actually wanting to to ask a, a question which is related to the purpose of the meeting we have today. Uh, I'm a little bit unclear about what we're trying to achieve here and what is exactly the purpose. Uh, echoing what, what Bill was saying, if the room had been mostly full of people who are not familiar with ICANN, it would have been mostly an outreach and engagement uh, system. There is a lot of ICANners who are, who are here, not all of the, of the room, but a lot of a lot of it. And we are, as usual, and it's very natural, we're transporting ICANN um, somewhere else. We're transporting ICANN, and this is not your fault because ICANN is faulty as well. Every year the open forum of ICANN is turning into an ICANN internal discussion. Whatever the hot topic of the day in the ICANN space at the moment becomes the topic that we deal with there. Echoing what Stefan is, is saying, I would, I would suggest that it is an interesting question to, at the IGF, discuss what changes in civil society participation when it is a decision, part of a decision-making structure versus a decision-shaping structure. And participation of civil society at the IGF is extremely easy. Everybody's open, equal footing, talking. It's like an open forum, you queue for the mic, no problem. 
The question of civil society participation in decision-making processes is raising extremely important questions that are not only within ICANN, that are more general regarding representation. Representation is an argument that is thrown at anybody promoting the multi-stakeholder model as a criticism, saying, but who do these guys represent? They are small groups. They are, can a single individual represent anything? Most of the structures, even within ICANN, are open to organization as you said. What about absolute individuals? Where do you fit as an absolute individual in, in ICANN? It's not easy, not in the structure. You can speak, you can talk, you can comment, but it's not that easy to be, yeah, okay, but that's the only place where you, where, where you can go, which means that there is an outreach, um, Bill was mentioning, organizations, but the Participation of individuals is an element that is important as well. What I wanted to say is there is a fundamental contribution that people in NCUC and NPOC can make to the whole debate within the IGF regarding what are the challenges, what are the specific challenges related to decision making. How do you cope with the question of weighted voting and how do you compose the different groups? Is the current balance fair, not fair? Who decides what the balance is? I was in the work, I participated when I was in the GAC, in the working group of the GNSO that discussed the restructuring and led to the two houses. It was decided relatively quickly, as those of you who were in the group know. And the end result is that it is a structure that has a great facilitation to be sorry for the pun, a little bit like sovereignty in international organizations. It's preventing anybody from the other house to do anything to your house. Just like I'm China, I don't want the United States to do anything to my... So you're separating separ sovereignties just like the international organizations are separating sovereignties. The move to the working group model is something that is strongly in favor of cooperation. And I was before in another panel on workable model for enhanced cooperation. And the distinction of something that is based on allocating specific seats to specific voting procedures to specific subconsistencies always ends up in a fight about, oh, I got a seat, you get a seat more, and a type of relationship where there is a distinction between a group and another one preventing interaction between them. What are the lessons that you all, or we all, take from participating in decision making on how to surmount non-consensus without having to kick it up to another thing, and among other things, put it on the board uh, table where they're voting. What is the difference between multi-stakeholder decision making and decision what multi-stakeholder decision shape. That, that's one thing I would like to do. Thank you. Let me just make sure I've got a, a cue here. Um, I've got uh, Peter and then the here and then Mari Moore and then Phil. Somebody else want to get in the queue? And then Chuck. Hi, Peter Dengate Thrush. I've never served on the, in the GNSO. I, I served for six years in the trenches for the CCTLDs and then seven and a half years on the board. So I've had an opportunity to help design and then redesign and then criticize the next redesign of the GNSO. I, I think Bertrand's question is a fascinating one. I've got a slightly more pragmatic one which perhaps you could just note and come back to. And it really sort of um, starts with my one of my probably my first law of ICANN, which is the price of self-regulation is eternal vigilance and tireless diligence. The amount of work that's involved is unbelievable. Keeping up, keeping up because every one, of those, every one of those members of the community is throwing, can throw things up and does, and every one of the groups inside the GNSO can be developing its own agenda. And then the board throws things and the GAC throws. You know. So how, 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 do you cope, how are you coping with that? And is, is there a system for... Uh, getting more 
workers into the GNSO. Um, and is there more I can as a corporation can do? And I'm thinking of just basic recruiting. You know, this is a really important set of workers and there doesn't seem to be much of an HR approach to looking after those workers and recruiting them and looking after them. And I wonder if you've got thoughts about that. And a specific subset of that is, you know, would paying, um, I fought quite a long battle eventually successfully, just as I was leaving, sadly, to get remuneration for board members. Um, the same principle, to my mind, applies even more strongly in, in working groups and at the GNSO. Is there, would that, do you think, make a difference if there were honorariums or compensation systems and forget about designing one now, um, but if there was some kind of compensation, would it make recruitment and would it make the work somehow more bearable? Um, and, you know, as a result of either of those or the absence of it, are you seeing volunteer fatigue? And if you are, what are you doing about it? Thank you. Peter, is there anyone who wanted to respond to Peter's questions before we move on in the queue? Uh, thanks for affording me the privilege of being on, on the panel and able to cut in or across the queue. But um, certainly uh, a, a lot of very important points there, which we, or certainly I as chair, and I'm sure the other people in, in this room who are chair have had to grapple with. Uh, uh, the pay issue is one that's, pers uh, well, sorry, compensation is one that's uh, very close to my heart because I, I've long argued that the amount of time the board members uh, spend doing their jobs uh, and the quality that we now uh, search for in board members, and this obviously crosses, a, a, uh, you know, it bridges both my GNSO positions and the NOMCOM now. Um, if you're looking for quality candidates uh, in the GNSO or anywhere else in the community now, at board level certainly, um, you need to ask them to almost take up a full-time commitment. So how can you balance that with their needs to either have a, you know, another job or, or be uh, at a high enough level uh, to be able to work and fulfill that commitment? One of the answers has been compensation. Um, I'm not sure, certainly if there is compensation for past, uh, for, sorry, GNSO um, uh, people, then I'll certainly uh, put in an application for my back pay. But um, uh, if that doesn't come, I'm not sure more seriously that uh, um, compensation is the right signal because um, it brings with it uh, a whole set of challenges on the, the motivations that people you know, have for coming in and doing that job. So uh, it's a very different ba a difficult balance to strike. On the one hand, I believe you need to be able to compensate people for their time, otherwise you don't get bluntly, put it bluntly, you don't get enough quality in the candidates. On the other hand, if you do start compensating, um, you end up with uh, people, you're, you're not really sure why they're there or if they're there for the right reasons, I should say. But bear in mind that at the, the crux of this issue um, is the one that we were talking about earlier on about is, the, is this model effective? Because um, currently, and this is one of the things Avery said, the reason you have so much business interest, in, especially uh, contracted business interest, is because Frankly, it's, uh, it's those people's jobs to be there. They already get paid to be there. So, you know, they are, in essence, being paid to be active community volunteers. And the only people who are doing it out of their own free time are the civil society people. I think, you know, that's an important point to make. So, you know, Peter's, uh, uh, as usual, made some, some very good and challenging points. I. I it's difficult to answer them. Recruitment, certainly, just to, to spend a, a very short amount of time on that. Volunteer burnout is a clear issue, and it's linked to the compensation because you're burning yourselves out trying to, to do two things at once. And certainly, if you're on the leadership team, trying to balance an everyday job with GNSO Council leadership is hell. Um, uh, you know, it, it's just, it really is difficult. So, um, uh, I don't have the answers, but uh, uh, certainly uh, problems that we had to grapple with. Thank you. Did you want to 
just a quick reaction uh, to Peter's comment and Stefan, I fully agree. I don't have any answers, but my experience in sharing working groups is that they're open to all the ICANN community, but uh, when, when the time comes, very few people participate. And sometimes uh, these working groups are captured by some people that maybe they have more time or they have special interests. So it, it is a model that looks nice because it's more open and, and more interactive into, into the ICANN community, but at the same time, it, it can be captured and, and endangered. So uh, workers in the GNSO, as Peter mentioned, it, uh, it's, uh, it's an important issue to solve. Thank you. Uh, back, back to your question, um, Bertrand. At least as a civil society for me, uh, coming to the IGF is like going back to school. You know, it's like thinking, hearing, listening to new trends, uh, you know, sharing information, and um, going to ICANN and, and being involved in the working group is, is going a step further, is getting to work and actually be involved in a process where you have to take decisions and, and, and you have to negotiate with people and, and develop policies. So, um, that, that would be it. Okay, so. I want, to speak, I want to speak to the resource issue. I think it is really important that Peter asked. Uh, you know, civil society people are there on their own. Um, we do have, we have organizational members, and some of those organizations have staffers who have a portfolio of different uh, processes they follow, and maybe doing ICANN work piece of somebody's portfolio. So you got a piece, a small piece of some, some staffers labor. A lot of the other people that you got in some society who are really doing stuff are there as individuals. Uh, there, uh, Bear Trump was saying before, you know, questions of accountability and so on. Well, we have elections. I mean, she was elected, I was elected, he was elected, all these people were elected by their peers. So our, our, even though we don't come from a centralized formal organization, our legitimacy and accountability comes from the fact that we had 170 people cast the vote and this was one and so okay? Um, but getting people to put the time and energy into the ICANN process, either as an individual or as a staffer of an organization, is very, very difficult because it is much more labor intensive than a lot of other processes that you participate in. Everything is very iterative. Everything is ongoing. Nothing is, you know, it's not like if you, if you go into, say, the OECD process and join the Social Society Advisory Group there, or you go into an IGF thing or something, you know, you'll have the activities all geared around a particular meeting, and then you're done. In ICANN, everything is ongoing, multi-year work programs that just never end with continuing uh, iterations over and over and people fry out. Um, and the other problem is you have to convince them that this is so central to the work that they do, the values they hold, the things they advocate for, that, it's, that it merits they moved up their agenda relative to everything else. So if somebody is a human rights worker, and they want to do digital human rights, and they're looking out at the world and they're saying governments are adopting censorship policies all over and they're filtering this and that, you say to them, yes, if you should worry about the domain name system. Um, for a lot of them, that doesn't seem like the most primary issue. I'm a human rights person. I'm, I am a person who's worried about developing countries and, and access. I'm a person who's worried about uh, excessive intellectual property claims, all these kinds of things. And I don't see the DNS as being my first stop in terms of the hierarchy of stuff that's important. So the challenge for us then is to say, well, wait. In fact, all those issues play out in the domain name space. Privacy is a big factor in the way the domain name space works. Intellectual property considerations are highly configurative of everything going on in here. So trying to connect the dots so that people will see that, in fact, the work that ICANN is doing is integral to the larger tapestry of Internet governance problems that you're working on convince them that they should stick with it and continue to put in that amount of volunteer labor, this is just very hard. And so inevitably, 
you know, we often hear from some of our business partners, you know, some society guys, they, they, their engagement lacks, you know, they're, sometimes they, in spurts they come, they work hard, then they disappear, we don't know where they are, we don't have enough of them in this particular working group or whatever. And it's hard for people whose job it is to track this stuff to realize that you're asking volunteers out of the love of the of the issues. So it's it's a very special challenge. And I, I think the people that are willing to commit to it are fairly crazy. Um, but actually <laughs> but actually the process is sufficiently interesting and important that once you get into it it becomes slightly addictive. And we all we all unfortunately that that I will say of the because half this room is ICANN regulars and half is not. The regulars are, we've got like this weird addiction. I'm sorry, I don't know how else to explain it. Some of my friends who are come from outside of ICANN, they say, why do you do this stuff? But it's like, uh, you know, you, if you stop doing it, you start jonesing for it. So, you know. Thanks. Um, Chuck, did you have a comment you wanted to make? Oh, I'm sorry. After, after this gentleman here, I apologize. Hello, uh, my name is Pranish Prakash. Uh, I work with the Center for Internet and Society, and I'm going to stand up so that everyone can see me uh, in, uh, at the Center for Internet and Society in India. Well, uh, my question is, there's been a, a fair amount of discussion around uh, diversity and, and representation uh, today, uh, but why is that uh, important in uh, GNSO uh, itself. So why is it important which region of the world you're from, whether you're from a developing country or not, what your gender is? Uh, because I can understand IDNs as a relatively limited part, okay, but you know there are other stakeholders that, uh, that represent it. So uh, as in it's in everyone's interest to have more IDNs in a sense, right? And so uh, are interests really aligned along those lines or are they along the lines of which commercial stakeholder community you belong to, whether you're government, whether you're a civil society, because around privacy, IP, etc., those are divided along those lines. So why is diversity important is one question. And if uh, representativeness and diversity is indeed important, then did the GNSO review uh, group that uh, we heard, heard about, I think, did that go into uh, that at the working group level? Uh, as well, or uh, what exactly was the analysis? I'm sorry, I haven't read the report. I should. Thank you. Is there anyone on the panel that wanted to um, respond to this? Yes. Well, it means that those regions were unaware at all of that process. This means internationalization of ICANN and GNSO. I, I've been participating very actively, and uh, we need more people from region. You need balance in the regional uh, activity in, in the community of ICANN, but it's not a problem only from the GNSO, it's from ICANN, but uh, I think Stefan said something very uh, interesting. Uh, th those companies that are interested have their own employees actively participating, and then there is civil society and other people, part of the community that try to participate. But uh, I can tell you that I can provide several ways of do participating, or remotely, or through fellowship or other uh, funding. So it's a matter of uh, motivating uh, the, how Peter said, GNSO workers. I like that concept. Uh, you, you need more people from different parts of the world. So all these comments are, and, and issues are brought to the, to the discussions. And now we have problems with developing countries not being uh, happy with some outcomes of the new GTL list, and I won't enter into that because that's an issue of other panels. Can someone get Rafiq the mic, please? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I want to reply to Branish why we need diversity. Yeah, it's not just okay. Uh, why we need diversity? It's not just for the sake of uh, diversity, but like uh, when um, uh, Olga talked about the problem of uh, new GTLD. So it's it was the NTAG when at that time we advocated that why we have this expensive uh, fees to apply for new new GTLD. And then we, we pushed it within GNSO. It was not easy at that time. 
and uh, we could uh, create in a working group and to have recommendation and asking and advocate the board to have um, it's not just about uh, the fees but um, to provide uh, a lot of support and so on so because we have that diversity we have people from developing countries who are sensitive to this issue we can advocate so that's why we need diversity it's not just to have from several regions so it's up to us also because we have we are maybe sensitive to other issues and so we, we can bring them to Geneso Council um, so yeah great now could we hear from Chuck and then we've got Mari Lor thank you Chuck Dome. Uh, I'm going to come back to the, the comments that David made because I think they're really critical to a lot of what we're talking about. But before I do that, let me say what I'm going to say doesn't detract from any of the needs or issues that other people have raised. But what David said was that the real focus should be on the working group level. I hope we haven't discouraged too many new people from joining working groups or getting involved in the GNSO today. The issues everybody's talking about are real. They, they are very real, okay? So I, I don't want to minimize that. I experienced them firsthand. Uh, the, but the focus really should be on the working group level, where it is open to everybody. Individuals are welcome there, just like organizations. And that's where the real work goes on. Now, our focus continues to be, and we've, we've talked about getting away from that over the years, but we, we never really succeeded. The, like David said, the council is supposed to manage the policy development process. They're not making policy. They should be evaluating whether or not, how can they help the working groups do better? How can they make sure there's full representation? How can they make sure that where there are problems uh, in getting participants, how can they motivate that? And in the end, when voting really occurs at the council level, it should be was the process followed? Was, were all stakeholders uh, uh, that, that are impacted, were they involved? And if not, were efforts made to do that? If the council was doing that, and by the way, it was no different than when I, when I was chair of the council. <laughs> so so I, I, I was no better than anybody else. Uh, if, they were, if, if that's really what the council did, probably wouldn't be as popular to be on the council because there's not as much power and glory associated with that. But in fact, I think that might really be a, a, a function that could really benefit and help the working group model, which is where policy is really developed. Marie Lord? Yes, thank you. Uh, going back to the diversity question, uh, we should not forget also that ICANN has been accused or labeled uh, from, you know, from its beginning as a US-focused based organization. So, uh, in, and it has been a criticism of this, uh, a very strong criticism. And, and there is a, right now a, a, a new process and the, and the new CEO, uh, uh, as well as all, all of us, we're trying you know, to, have, to, to have on board more people open offices all over the world. So, so this diversity and geographical representation is very, it, it, it's a key factor uh, uh, in the sense that it can make ICANN a more international organization, well, internationalized, not, not an international organization. And also the, the, the working group, um, the working group level, uh, I would like to describe very briefly my experience uh, because it, we just, uh, Avery and myself, as well as, as two other, uh, uh, colleagues from uh, NCSG, we just uh, we belong to. A, we've been participating in a working group for almost a year about uh, on, on, on the who is a big, uh, you know, who is, and uh, has been very very interesting experience. My first uh, working group, um, uh, first time I participated, and and uh, it, this is hard work. It's true. You have to be on the conference call every week for at least uh, an hour. You have to do the readings in between, you know, the sessions. If we want to, you know, if you want to do a serious job, I mean, if you want to give to be very active, I mean, the, the level of participation is really up to you. I mean, 
depends on, on the amount of time you have and, and the passion you have. It really, it really dep it's up to you know each person. We, I, I remember that we started out, we were roughly, what, 30 members, and, and we ended up, I mean, like 10, no, 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 more than that, 10 to 12 really, like the most active members. And uh, it has been very uh, interesting, time consuming, but uh, interestingly enough, the four of us from the NCSG uh, uh, group, uh, we uh, joined the sub, uh, a subgroup within this working group on data protection and privacy, because this was sort of the issue that, that was most interesting to us, and we wanted to fight about, you know, some. Uh, yeah, we wanted to make a point, and, and at the end, I think that the pressure and our presence in the working group, uh, we ended up, uh, I'm pretty pleased with the, 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 you know, the reports and the, the recommendations, and I think at least two, and then we reached a full consensus. And, but but we, we were around, and every week, and, and we went on and on and on, and, and having background, background discussion and debates, and, open ones and, and, and thanks to our presence, maybe some things went in the, re, uh, in the report that without us wouldn't, you know, wouldn't have been uh, agreed on. Thank you. I think we've got one final question here and then we'll go to uh, final comments from the panel. Thank you. I'd like to go back to something that Rafik said. I'm not quite sure that I understood the, what he said, but I'd like to build on that to ask uh, a question. Um, you mentioned the importance of having developing country representatives to push for some issues such as price of the new GTLDs, for instance. And price for developing countries is something quite sensitive. It means for us inclusion into the process. And I wonder sometimes uh, if there is an understanding in ICANN if uh, the organization performs a public function, because uh, we know it's a corporation, but does the organization as a whole see itself as an organization that performs a global public function and has a public role? Um, because sometimes I think that yes, we are talking about internationalization, so I think that uh, you no, know, this role is, is evident. But at some point, uh, I don't understand because if this role, or this public role, or global public role is relevant, then why not prices are an issue? In, in spite of the fact that people are not there actually pushing for it, because it should be an issue. We don't need to have advocates for that if you are an organization that performs a global public function. And uh, a couple of years ago, I asked a question in a panel about, about ICANN, if there has been some study of impact of the new GTLDs in developing countries before launching the program. And the answer, from a developing country representative in ICANN was that um, actually we did not carry out that study before we put that in place and I find that uh, so I just would like to, to, to understand how the organization sees itself. If I, if I may uh, chime in on, on, on the question that Marilia is asking. When we say ICANN, we conflate a lot of things. What is the ICANN that you're talking about. There are the decisions that the board makes, there are decisions that the staff make, although they shouldn't be making decisions normally, but in some cases they do. There are policies that are developed by the organization in the GNSO. There are positions by the government. All of these pieces are ICANN as a whole. The organization is, and I would label it uh, on a personal basis, it is a global public interest organization. That's what the system is about. And the question you ask is a very, very important uh, question. In Singapore, <coughs> when the final vote on the new GTLD program was, uh, was made, and the whole room was applauding, and I happily voted in favor of the program. Afterwards, I went to almost all the friends I know in the community who were applicants and so on, and I said, raise your right hand and repeat after me. I solemnly pledge to respect the letter and the spirit of the new GTLD applicant guidebook 
and to make sure that whoever I see was not following these things, I will encourage them to be faithful to what they have decided. And guess what? More than 90% of the people that I was asking that from made the pledge without any problem. I won't quote names. I remember four people who didn't want to make the pledge. This system doesn't function because the staff is in charge of the global public interest. It is not because the board is in charge of the public interest, although it is a part of it. It is also because the participants, not because they are kind, you don't build a policy system on the goodwill or the kindness, but because the participants, because of the way the process functions, are encouraged to incorporate the global public interest in the way they discuss and negotiate. When you negotiate exclusively your interest versus somebody else's interest, anybody who is not in the room will not be part of the discussion. If, as I mentioned earlier, the early stages are sufficiently open, sufficiently comprehensive, sufficiently in-depth to formulate the problem or the question in a term that is really encompassing the interest of everybody, then the discussion afterwards will be working better. And I would be the first to agree that the way the whole discussion on the new GTLD program has been started probably didn't spend enough time early on to exactly imagine, examine what we all collectively wanted to do with this and where the global public interest approach was. The end result is, thanks to the multi-stakeholder process, much better than what any other process run by governments or by business alone or by even civil society alone would have been. But still, it could have been better. But it is the whole system and the procedures that guarantee the global public interest. Contrary to what, sorry to, to be long, but contrary to what Steve Bianco sometimes says in, in public forum, and we had discussions on, on this very uh, friendly, there is no definition, no definition of the public interest, neither at the national level nor the global level. But at the national level, the constitutional processes are supposed to be balanced in order to produce something that is accepted by that community as being the outcome of the national interest. It's voted in a law that is voted and so on. Likewise, at the international level, for the limited range that we're talking about, the procedures of ICANN have to be constructed in a way that guarantees that everybody feels that the outcome of those procedures is sufficiently representing the global public interest. Thank you, Bill. Hi. Um, well, we need to move towards wrapping it, but we're actually the conversation is kind of getting interesting now too. Um, really, uh, actually, you know, the um, first ICANN meeting I went to as a counselor, as a GNSO counselor, all green behind the ears, was Mexico City in 2009, and there was this big debate going on in a sort of plenary session about this notion of what is the public interest and. I remember that a lot of the, the private sector people were expressing just exasperation and saying, I don't know why we're talking about this, I don't know what this is supposed to refer to, and so on. And that was my introduction. And I thought, you know, this is an organization that is seriously conflicted. Um, but the, the reality is it's a complex organization that reflects the totality of different players that have stakes around DNS issues. A lot of the people that come into the process are there for the money. There's no question. There are folks there who are all about the Benjamin. They're there to, to buy and sell domain names and so on and so forth. There's also a lot of other people who view it as a global public policy, public interest oriented organization that is establishing rules that shape the naming and numbering system upon which we all rely and who feel very strongly about trying to make sure that's done in a way that balances the diverse interests of commercial, non-commercial, and other players. And so you can't reduce it to one, you can't reduce a big community down to one vision as to, you know, in a totalizing way. There are people there who have one kind of conception of the process. 
where people have another kind of conception of the process. Every ICAM meeting is as big as an IGF meeting. I, every you know you go, it's 1,500 people, it's 2,000 people. They're there for a week working hardcore nonstop. They're serious about this stuff, and they have different motivations. But as long as the leadership of the organization fundamentally sets out the predicate that you know this is an organization that has these broader responsibilities, not just to the community but to the world, um, and that is articulated by the CEO and the senior staff and the board of directors and the leadership in the other bodies, then I think, you know, even, you can get over the fact that a lot of other people are just there for money. You could still effectively have good policy outcomes that are in the public interest. And there are ways to try to shape things and make things better. The price thing was an example, you know, um, not to belabor the point, but yes, when it started out, it was 185000 for everybody to make a pitch for a new GTLD, and it was still society actors in us, in, in NCUC, and, and ALAC, uh, that large community, and later GAC people, who said, you know, we should have a program to provide assistance to developing countries. As it happened, the program turned out not to be well executed. It was not well implemented. We didn't get a lot of take up, but there was an effort, and that changed minds to people learn that we have to take these considerations into account more. So I think it's a learning organization as well. It's not a, it's not, you know, an organization that doesn't look at its own experience and try to recalibrate in light of what's going on. We're constantly trying to improve. And, and I think that that's a good thing. And I just want to point out, by the way, if anybody is interested in more substantive discussions, because we've talked mostly process here, uh, tomorrow, NCUC has a workshop at 11 o'clock on the topic of closed generic TLDs, which is a very controversial issue. I just wanted to point that out. Thank you. And uh, we're, we're a couple minutes after now, so we're going to have to bring this to a close. But I wanted to thank all of our panelists for participating and our, our um, audience participants as well. And um, for those who might be interested in getting involved and getting engaged to, with civil society at ICANN, you may want to consider joining the non-commercial stakeholder group. Um, it's a good opportunity to, to get engaged in the, the policy development process. So with that, I think we can wrap it up and thank you all. <laughs>